Good morning and good afternoon to those who are entering into the space. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm gonna to go ahead and get us going. My name is Ruthie Pano simmons um, I am an equity specialist and professional development uh, content specialist at the Michigan um, MTSS Center for uh, Technical Assistance. And I'm gonna have my um, colleague introduce herself as well. I also do work for the Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center. And Hi. Gonna... Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Beth Hill and I also work with Michigan's MTSS Technical Assistance Center. I am working as a um, equity specialist and also working with the ISF work, the Interconnected Systems Framework work. And I will be um, also part of the presentation and really supporting Ruthie as she goes through. So we'll be monitoring your the polls and the, the chats and trying to um, bring your voices into the room. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if you could, I, uh, well, you already did this, so we, we made a quick modification. We know that most of you are working at the school levels or working with staff at the school levels to support what's happening in buildings and in schools. So we really are excited to share some of the information that we have today. And we hope that um, this information will support you as you're continuing in your work with implementing and maintaining PBIS. So we have a poll we want to start with right away. And we want to ask you, are you engaging in equity work within your PBIS systems? So you're going to need to go uh, to your Packable and use the poll feature to actually um, respond to that first poll. And then my colleague Beth is going to share some of what she's seeing. So far, Ruthie, it says 76% yes and, well, now it's 70 to 30, 70% yes and 30% no of engaging in the equity work. Yeah, that's really awesome. And as you're continuing to put that information in, what's really exciting is that with 70 to 80% of you centering equity in your work, we're on that trajectory to make sure the work that we're doing around implementing PBIS, that we're intentionally looking to center equity. And so our session today is going to talk about some work that we've done through some pilot schools uh, and some activities that we've engaged in with our partners to support them in centering equity within their PBIS systems. So we're gonna explore educational equity within um, the PBIS pilot that we're doing in Michigan. Um, and then also we're gonna examine some strategies for increasing equitable discipline practices and outcomes. And then we will share some outcomes um, that we have seen with um, some of our partners, but also with um, changes in behaviors that we're seeing with some of the adults that are also engaging in the pilot work. And then of course, as I'm uh, sharing today, Beth is going to chime in here and there as she needs to. And so um, we're just looking forward to this. We wanna quickly acknowledge our pilot partners um, who we've learned a tremendous amount um, from uh, and them allowing us to be able to come into their different spaces. We wanna acknowledge the PBIS um, TA Center because we are um, leveraging tools from the TA Center to do this pilot work. And we're learning a lot from that process. We're also leveraging tools and resources from the Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center as we look more closely and intentionally on centering equity within the process. And of course, our own center um, supports us in doing this work and we bring our own experiences and expertise to this space. So we wanna acknowledge that today. And we wanna kinda ask you just really quickly, just thinking about Dr. LaSalle's um, uh, session yesterday for those who were able to be a part of that. I was a part of that and it was a very powerful session. And a lot of what she talked about was really getting at le leaving a legacy. One of the things that my colleague Beth and I do when we work with our partners is we talk with them about, we, we've inherited systems, systems of inequities that um, we didn't have anything to do with. However, we have the opportunity now to do some things in the systems that we've inherited to make them better for those who are working, that we're working with, but also those who are gonna come after. And so I'm always thinking about Atul Gwande because he says that the task of our generation is to make systems work. And I really wanna say, uh, we wanna do more than make them work. We wanna make sure they're working for every student, regardless of uh, their identity or the multi-identities that we all tend to encompass. So we want you to quickly use the chat and we're gonna keep moving and, and Beth is going to kind of chime in and let me know what some of the responses are. 
And we're gonna do a quick reflect and share. We're gonna share via chat. So leaving a legacy, use the chat feature and just kind of share what's gonna be your legacy with regards to educational equity. What will the next generation say about us as human beings, as educational leaders, from the classroom to central office to departments of education to those who are making laws about education? And what will the next generation have to endure based on the work and the systems that we're creating? And then Beth, as soon as you're seeing responses, be, feel free to share any things that you're seeing coming up. Yep, I'm seeing people say we cared, that we were change agents. Um, it's hopefully that we actually made improvements. Student and family voices have been given greater voice and been valued. Um, leveling the playing field. Um, I love it. Everyone's being really positive of, of where they're going with their work. Um, good allies, agents of change. We finally admitted there was a problem. Um, a lot of student-led focusing on the whole student. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. You can share it. You know, as more of those come in, if you're seeing things, just, you know, interrupt me and share some of what is, is being shared. Because even though we're in a virtual space, learning is not one direction. As we're sharing what we're learning, we also want to hear from you in terms of what you're learning and what you're bringing to this conversation today. And we'll do our best to keep with the time, but also acknowledge a lot of the important work that's going on across the country. And so, yes, we want to leave a legacy that says we did more or we added to and contributed to making things better, just as those who've come before us uh, uh, try to do the same thing. And for those systems that we inherited that we did not create, we're going to do our best to work to, to impact change within those systems. Mm -hmm. Seeing a lot of focus on the students and that we're brave enough to interrogate and look at our own selves. Um, so really, really good focus of yeah. ourselves and not sundering systems or sundering the students and families as issues. I really appreciate that. Uh, words that really catch my attention, interrogate, um, and, and internal self-reflection, um, reflecting on systems, uh, doing what's best for our students. I really appreciate that. These were our original Michigan equity pilot goals to demonstrate meaningful reduction in discipline, to try to implement and evaluate uh, effective practices for addressing disproportionality, to implement a model uh, that would reduce uh, disproportionality, and to uh, see outcomes with our schools implementing PBIS with fidelity uh, to see if we could uh, see reduced um, um, uh, a re reduction in the discipline gap that everyone has been talking about in the work that we're engaging in. And one of the things that I want to add here is that while these were our original goals, I believe even before I started with our center in 2015, 2016, these goals have morphed and changed. We've looked more at not focusing so much on disproportionality, but focusing on what it means to center equity for our students and what does it look like within PBIS. And so we know that while tremendous gains have been made um, with, within the work with, that we do with PBIS, that we are still working to make sure that systems are equitable for our students and that that's reflected in the outcomes that we see for our students. So one of the things that Beth and I did as we were working with our partners across the state, we'll talk a little bit about our partners in just a moment, but as we said, it's not enough to, to stop with the goals for the overall pilot. What are gonna be the goals that we're gonna use to support coaching and providing technical assistance to our partners as they uh, work to center equity in their PBIS work? And so we really wanted to focus on systematically examining disaggregated discipline data and supporting our teams and developing action plans specific to centering equity within their PBIS systems. We also wanted to explicitly name and understand the role of race in the inequitable outcomes and by engaging in ongoing learning around implicit bias and around our social historical context. And so we, we're gonna talk about different activities and share activities that you can go back and actually use as you're working to center equity uh, in your systems. We also wanted to provide um, our partners with the opportunity to deepen knowledge on how core components of PBIS, vulnerable decision points, culturally responsive and sustaining practices, and safe and inclusive schools 
um, that framework from the MAP Center, the Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center, could work together to create equitable experiences for all of our students. And finally, but most importantly, we really wanted to support our colleagues and our partners and ourselves uh, in fostering a critical consciousness uh, so that we could do this work with intentionality and that we could really make sure that we were uh, questioning how we're complicit in the inequitable uh, systems that we um, have and the outcomes that we see. So I'm gonna ask my colleague Beth now to talk a little, about, a little bit about the context of the schools that have been a part of our pilot work over the last several years. So we started um, several years ago and um, really using the five point intervention and right away we um, started jumping into data. And Kent, if you were in the last session, shared how really jumping into data right away can, you know, can throw people off. But so our, our first schools were local schools here. I'm in um, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And so we had some schools from the west side of the state. And then um, actually right along the lake shore, two different schools. And so the the six eight was in one um, area, and the K eight with was in right on the lake shore. And both schools had worked with my Blissey before, so they had a background of using PBIS and the you know setting up systems. And so when we started with these schools, one of the things that happened was they identified that we asked, and they were like, "Yes, we want to do this work." Um, and so that's where we started. And um, we, were, we knew that that was really important as having the systems, um, schools having the systems. But what we really found is with schools who've been implementing for a while, there was a lot of drift. So we ended up in those first couple of years really looking at trying to get the PBI systems back in place and really coming up a lot um, against a lot of um, pushback with the, with the equity work. The school said yes. But the, the district said yes, the schools were not as thrilled with us being there. So um, it's a little context of the first schools we started with and how we started. And we'll kind of get into some of our learning and missteps down the line. But then as um, Ruth joined, we, um, we partnered with schools then on the east side of the state also and um, transitioned. And so the schools in green are schools that finished the whole three year pilot. And then the schools um, in the red are schools that dropped out that didn't continue with us. And then in the blue, as we've pivoted, um, these are schools that didn't choose to end, but we've pivoted our work and our embedding equity within um, our center and not doing the, the pilot work really as um, the same anymore. So um, those schools are, we were working with and we're wanting to continue and are still wanting to continue, but we're hoping to support them with the work we're doing with um, embedding equity within. Thank you so much for sharing that, um, Beth. And I think what we, we saw from the first three schools well, was this need to go in and really start with data. What we, what, and even in schools four and five, we went in and we started with data. And what we saw was this denial of the fact that there were issues around equity. Questions such as, do we have to talk about race, even though the, the data show that they're, they're, the, the gaps that they saw were um, race-based. Um, even asking, could we do this work without having to have conversations um, around race? And even saying, looking, noticing how their white students were above the national median and completely ignoring uh, some of the gaps that they were seeing um, with students who were um, even more um, beyond the national median and other groups. And so, um, those are things we're going to talk about as well. We, uh, we are using, and we did use, the five-point approach that you see there on the screen. We focus on uh, uh, collect and use data, number one. We also focused on um, implementing a behavior framework because the schools, um, one of the requirements was that they were already implementing PBIS because we found when schools are already implementing PBIS and they have systems in place, we can leverage those existing systems to then think about how do you elaborate culturally. We have some amazing colleagues that are going to follow this presentation and do some work around how to, uh, to make sure that PBIS is culturally responsive. Uh, how do you center those practices within PBIS? Uh, we'll have a few examples that we're going to share as well. And so we did focus on uh, supporting our partners and making sure that they were strengthening PBIS. And then we also focused on five. 
uh, teaching strategies for neutralizing implicit bias and discipline decisions. And if you were just in our colleague's last session, um, he did some work on unpacking what that was and how that looks within React uh, uh, work that they're doing. And so those were natural entry points for us with our partners. And so that's where we started the work um, and, and did most of our pilot work. Some key features related to centering equity and PBIS are, and these are things that some of our people learn. These are some things that we knew, go, some of us knew going in, but they're still counted as lessons learned. Systematically examining discipline data and setting goals and intentional action plans and supporting teams and acknowledging and addressing race-based discipline disparities is a key feature. Um, as coaches, serving as critical friends to foster critical consciousness and staff in with our leadership teams at the school level um, is essential to understanding and naming racial gaps and racial bias. Uh, and using vulnerable decision points when, and, and implementing well, we identify vulnerable decision points and implementing neutralizing routines, we found was really helpful because some of the work around fostering critical consciousness takes time and everyone's at a different place. You need some immediate things that you can do to neutralize bias while you're learning about why you're using those strategies in the first place. We found it was important to do both. And so getting to those um, BDPs and those neutralizing routines right away was a critical part of our work. And then also another key feature related to centering equity and PBIS really is making sure that leadership at the district and building level um, um, uh, sustain the practices by uh, allocating and reallocating resources, by be, being a part of the professional learning um, with the partners that you saw in the green and in the blue. The administrative teams were present in every data meeting and in every professional develop meeting so that they could make decisions. And I didn't say this, but I, my background, uh, I was a principal for several, several years uh, of a, a kindergarten through fourth grade building, and then I was a curriculum director um, and staff development director um, for a mid-sized district uh, that was pre-K uh, pre post-12. Um, and so um, it's so important uh, to, for those who are making structural decisions to also understand what it is that they're asking uh, teachers and support staff to do. So the more that administrators have that awareness and understanding, the more they can remove barriers and also support the work being sustained. So we have a second poll and we wanna ask you, have your staff, have you or your staff collectively engaged in work to uh, either define educational equity, engage in ongoing learning around understanding how power and privilege contributes to systemic inequities? Um, have you worked to systemically examine this data? Um, have you not gotten to any of those particular things yet? Uh, if you could use the poll feature for poll number two, Beth is gonna let us know what she's seeing as that comes through. People are already going to town, that's great, thank you. A lot of people have um, examining are examining the disaggregated discipline data, 41%. Um, just about a quarter have defined educational equity, which is wonderful. Yes. That was a big part of what we were missing when we first started, um, engaging in learning around understanding how power and privilege contributes to systemic inequities, 23%. That's awesome. 12% of, um, so far that none of the, none of the options so so that's really helpful because what it helps us to see is that people again are in different places with regards to their work and those were all you know just some examples of pieces that are very critical to the work for those of you who are saying that you may not have started yet that's okay i think one of the things that i heard dr lasalle say or i was in several sessions yesterday so i don't want to mix anything up but if you haven't started yet that's okay um now is the perfect time to start and hopefully the sessions that you're able to see today and the materials that you're able to keep from the sessions will give you some starting points to be able to go back and, and start the conversations or um, move forward with some of the resources that are provided. And the National TA Center, um, PBIS Center, has a wealth of resources for getting started with this work. And the, uh, the Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center also has a lot of resources for uh, deepening knowledge around issues of equity and issues of systemic um, inequities around culturally responsiveness and others. A critical feature that was huge in our pilot work that we um, recognized um, was that we learned that we needed to define and operationalize educational equity 
as well as engage in discourse on power and privilege before our schools could begin to really address inequities in our schools. And so we were talking about equity all day, up and down, around the block and back again, and had not defined it. And so um, that makes it difficult for people to know what is it, what is it that we're trying to do? And more importantly, what does it look like, feel like, and sound like when we're thinking about this work within PDIS? And so as we were learning from this work, we continue to implement um, practices based on that learning. And so we're gonna explore educational equity right now. We're gonna examine strategies for increasing equitable discipline practices and outcomes. So first we're gonna define what we mean by educational equity. We're gonna unpack the four constructs of equity, educational equity, and then we're gonna provide several of the uh, examples of the professional development learning activities we use to try to uh, support deepening knowledge around equity to enhance implementation of PBIS that centered equity. So here's the definition right here, and I'm just going to read it. Educational equity is, did you, did you want to say something about it? Yes, if I could. Um, some questions are coming in of like, hopefully we'll find out how to start this work. How do we keep, um, you know, staff engaged in, in the work of equity amid? I can't read the full questions here where it's showing, but tips for reinforcing the importance of understanding implicit bias. So just um, want people to know that we, Ruth is going to be covering this and um, we are monitoring the questions. So she is going to share a lot of the um, of ways of, and activities that we were doing along um, to really embed and keep people engaged in this work. So I just want to let people know we are monitoring those questions. So you can keep them coming in. Yeah, thank you so much, Beth. And thank you for those questions. Those are really good questions. Uh, if we don't answer something uh, by the end of the session and in, in the Q&A, we'll try to follow up with any emails that you would send. And I am a, a person who can locate resources pretty quickly and share them. So I'm willing to, to, be, to do that as well as we move forward. So let's talk about educational equity, right? Because if we're gonna do this work, we should define this work. So educational equity is when educational policies, practices, interactions, and resources are representative of, constructed by, and responsive to all people so that each individual has access to meaningfully participate in and have positive outcomes from high quality learning experiences, regardless of individual characteristics um, and group memberships. So if you would look, you'll see there, there are these core concepts that this definition is uh, the definition that we um, use from the Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center. The Midwest Equity Plains Assistance Center is uh, located in Indiana, and Michigan is one of their 13 states that they support. So we didn't want to have a different definition from those uh, from, from the, the Equity Center because we know schools that we work with are also working with the Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center. Also, the definition is um, sound and is grounded in um, research around equity, around asset-based pedagogies, um, around universal learning. And so it really does hit on several bodies of work. If you notice, there are four key constructs that are in bold. Representative of, access, meaningful part, meaningfully participates, positive outcomes. And so let's unpack those. And I'm gonna do that as quickly as I can. And hopefully I'm not talking too fast. But access really is about all students having interest and in, entrance into and involvement with um, and full benefit of quality learning opportunities. And access is not the same as availability. Representation is more about being present uh, and, and who is at the table and, and empowered to contribute and who isn't and who benefits and who doesn't. And that's critical when we're talking about implementing PBS because often a team of people will go to training, come back, provide learning to staff and begin to implement PBIS. When we center educational equity um, within PBIS, we have to make sure we're thinking about who's benefiting from the way that things are and who's not. And also who's at the table when decisions around what PBIS will look like, feel like, and sound like is being implemented. Representation, again, is related to all students and families, regardless of, our, regardless of their identity markers, um, having that presence um, in decision-making and in content. So how are families engaged in the decision-making process as PBIS is being developed and then implemented and maintained? Also, meaningful participation occurs when all students have agency and are empowered to contribute in effectual ways. So in what way, ways are student voice or is student voice elevated and situated and centered in the PBIS process? And then high outcomes occur when solutions 
benefit all students towards self-determination and the ability to act as contributing citizens, not only in their school community, but in our society, which is a democratic society. And so we have to think about that. And it's important to work to have all four of these constructs in place and fully functioning in order for educational equity to truly be centered. So based on this definition, we could say that centering PBIS occurs when PBIS is representative of, constructed by, and responsive to all individuals within the school community so that teams developing and implementing and monitoring PBIS are representative of multiple and diverse stakeholders and perspectives and ways that allow for meaningful participation of PBIS practices that are culturally responsive and sustaining and supports and achieves high social, behavioral, and academic outcomes for all students across individual characteristics and group memberships. I know that is a lot. Uh, we're gonna unpack what that looks like in a little bit. Feels like and sounds like in PBIS. So let's talk a little bit about what educational equity is and is not because a lot of people are naming it. A lot of people are saying that they're doing it similar to when people say they're doing culturally responsive and sustaining work. We really have to begin to interrogate to what degree are we doing these things and where do we need to focus more? And so when we talk about what educational equity is and is not, we think about disproportionality. We've done a lot of work in focusing on disproportionality. We have over 40 years of data from the US Department of Education on the fact that we have issues with disproportionality. And so that is a critical piece of this work. However, looking at data to address disproportionality is really only one slice of the, uh, the pie, right? Um, or the work that's involved in educational equity. Really, we have to begin to ask, what is it about our people? What is it about our practices? What is it about our policies? What is it about our systems that are contributing to the inequities that we are seeing? And we have to ask, who is benefiting from the way things are and who are not? So even though we're gonna focus quite a bit on looking at disaggregated discipline data, we also have to begin to ask while looking at that data, what is the context in which teachers teach and students learn? What, what are those things that are happening within the practices and the systems uh, that are contributing to the disproportionality that we're seeing? So that the more we focus on those things, the more we can address uh, those inequitable outcomes that we're seeing. So we're gonna now talk about some of the activities that we engaged in around supporting um, applying equity within PBIS. And these are activities that we hope you'll be able to take back and begin to use right away. So let's look at sample activity one, understanding achievement gap origins. Long before we have our partners, like after we got to about the fourth or fifth partner that you saw on that table, we made a decision, we need to stop starting with the data. Even when we started with the national data and then and had the, the teams look at their, their data, that was not enough buffer for some of the, I think, fragility that they may have been experiencing looking at that gap between their white and your black students. Because for all of our partners, that's where the gaps were more pronounced. So we focused wherever the gaps showed up. Had it been something else, we would have been focusing on that. And so we thought we need to build and cultivate some critical consciousness so that when our teams look at their data, they're looking at that data through a critical lens or a, a lens that they're cultivating to be more critical. So this activity is an article that you have the link to uh, that will help to give some history on our social historical context around where systemic inequities uh, started, how they've impacted school. She talks a lot about the educational debt. Uh, and so what we did is we had teams get into groups to read the article and then they begin to have them uh, do some activities around the article and conversations around the article. One example was having them have a quote that we pulled out and having them read that article from a separate, a different article to tie it into this particular one that you're seeing here um, with Dr. Latz and Billings. And it generated some very deep conversations like right away. And then we followed up with that activity um, with reframing the achievement gap because we focus a lot on disproportionality and achievement gaps. But what that does is it almost automatically causes us to begin to think about fixing the student, fixing the teacher. Equity work is not about fixing students and teachers. It's about working on uh, addressing inadequacies within the system. Uh, the systems that are supporting teaching and learning. And so we did activities where we had them, you know, like begin to think about some of the things that we say and think without realizing it. For an example, this meritocratic 
a quote here, with hard work, anyone can be successful in society. Like we hear that a lot. If you just work hard enough, you, you, you can do it. And when we say that, we're ignoring uh, hundreds of years of systemic inequity that's made it very difficult for uh, some people to be successful. We're ignoring how school structures have been set up uh, that uh, uh, to be more beneficial to some, even though it's unintentional and not for others. And so by reframing the achievement gap, we focus on some of the systemic issues that contribute to um, achievement gaps. And this will be a quick example of what I'm talking about. When I was a curriculum director every year, um, I had to do um, the top 10. And I, every year, the top 10 students uh, uh, grant them their awards. They always look the same. It was usually about nine, eight or nine white students and maybe one or two students who were of Asian American. Uh, and so um, I, I, I used to think, is, are, are there no students outside of these two identities, identity groups that uh, are showing high academic outcomes? And then we started looking at our data for AP courses. We, I started seeing that it was the same thing. And I started asking, are we saying that our students that um, are, that all of our students, that students are uh, from, um, excuse me, marginalized groups aren't um, capable of accessing and doing this work? And so really it wasn't about what was going on with students. We really needed to begin to think about what's going on with our systems that's contributing to those experiences. So we, we would have them assign roles with this article. We would leverage you know, content from the Achievement Gap article and discuss ways that they're observing the practices from the article in their own work, ways that they um, can support to change some of the practices that, that they're seeing. And again, it was getting them into this discourse that's a, a requirement of equity work, um, having conversations around acknowledging some of the inequities. And then we move from that to say, okay, how do we then begin to challenge the status quo of what we've been thinking and believing so that we can push past that and do some deeper work? And so a pre-assignment that we use is the fundamentals of educational equity. And what we did was we wanted to begin to help the teams to find educational equity for themselves. And this article un, uh, defines educational equity from the Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center. And so we wanted them to, to begin to uh, critique their own questions. And so by doing that, we had them uh, get into a space where they could like begin to talk about the statements that they saw and then how was their uh, feelings and thoughts about the statements changing as a result of what they were reading and what did they identify with. And critical to this work is allowing a space for people to be completely honest with where they, with where they are, even if it feels that they're and a place that they need to come up from because we're all at different entry points. And so one of the things that Beth and I worked really hard on was cultivating safe spaces to have these conversations. And we don't have this in the slide, but we lean heavily on Linton and Singleton's framework for engaging in courageous conversations. And we spent probably about maybe two to three hours across the pilot providing professional learning on those four, um, those four commitments uh, so that uh, we could leverage them and our partners could leverage them as we were engaging in the work. Then after we did that, another activity that we um, involved in was having them reread the article uh, and then before coming back together and then having them to write down their definition of educational equity and then to have them turn and talk and then to do a group share out. Part of the work was getting them to individually define equity and then to collectively have a definition for equity within their building so that they were working from the same page, knowing that they could leverage the definition from the Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center to do that. So now I'm gonna ask my colleague if she would just take a minute and talk about this particular image here because these are partners that she led with and I supported as she led with. So in this work, we- Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. I think I'm trying to make sure uh, I don't interrupt. Um, one of the things that we, um, when we did this is we had them break into groups. We found it so important, to the small groups and then coming back together and really having the school examine what do they see as educational equity? How does that compare? And then coming back and comparing you know, to the MAP Center and um, how are they embedding that in, in their classroom systems and their you know, overall system? So it was really, um, yeah, excellent activity and, and work to do with, with the school of, of, they have to start, you know, really buying into it and making it their own. 
and with with that guidance. So this is it was um, it was really good work as as we got into this and and it was challenging work for them. Thank you so much, um, Beth, for sharing. And one thing that we had learned from uh, some of our earlier partners and the, the schools three and four that you saw earlier on was that we started doing this on the latter part of the pilot with them after we had started the pilot with showing them their data and going through the process of looking at and problem solving around their, um, dis their inequities that they were seeing. And when we finally got to the point where we realized we needed to define equity, we needed to have them unpacking it. Some of the feedback we got from some of the most uh, from, the, from the staff members that were most resistant um, in the earlier parts were, we wish we had had this at, um, earlier on. We wish we'd had the opportunity to do this earlier on. So we thought, let's start with this right away with our um, uh, any new partner coming forward so that we can get them thinking less about, uh, especially as outsiders coming in, that we're coming in and saying, aha, Look at what's going on more and less of that and more of we're in this together and how do we do this journey together mm -hmm. so um like beth just said some of the partners that she was showing um were really starting to define educational equity on the east side west side of the state we were uh, defining educational equity on the east side of the state and so um, one of the things that became critical was not just defining educational equity, but then asking, so what does PBIS look like, sound like, and feel like when equity is centered? So we're gonna unpack for you some ways that we started getting at that on the latter part of our pilot work, schools six and seven. Schools uh, five, six, and four, five, six, and seven. And so let's unpack that. At the top of each of the slides that you're gonna see are gonna be the big ideas of PBIS. So the top of the screen, you can see identify and define behavior expectations. And then what you can see is the four constructs of equity that we just defined for you a few slides ago. And so because of time, there's no way that I can read each one of these for each behavior expectation, but I'm gonna highlight some key things that are in them. And because you have a copy of them, you can have some time to go back and, and look at them more closely. But for access, we thought the way that we center equity is to make sure that behavior expectations are culturally situated and not based solely on dominant white middle class norms as the standard to which all students would be held to. This is why it's important for us to ask who's at the table when PBIS is being implemented and also as it's being monitored and improved over time. For representation, we thought centering equity would involve multiple and diverse stakeholders being a significant part of identifying and defining, defining behavior expectations. And there are creative ways to get at that, but a very critical piece. For meaningful participation with regards to identifying and defining behavior expectation, we thought schools have to value and use the input and feedback from students, parents, staff, community members representing multiple and diverse perspectives when identifying and defining behavior expectations. When you start including those different um, perspectives in a space where you're making decisions, educational decisions, it changes the conversation and it makes it more culturally nuanced so that what we're asking students to do is reflective of their lived experiences, of their values, and of functional behaviors that work for them, even if we're gonna identify a set of behaviors that we're gonna have in school and behaviors that might be in other places. And then also high outcomes. Schools ensure that the identified, defined behavior expectations reflect the communities in which a school is situated and that all schools are set up for success across all student identities. And keep in mind that even though uh, we are sharing uh, somewhat of a rubric for how do we, uh, what does it look like, feel like, and sound like, we're continuing to actually revise and edit these as we learn. So, that's something we're gonna to continue to do. When it comes to teaching behavior expectations, I'm gonna unclear, uh, expose each of these because I want you just to take a look and see what you're seeing across each of the four of them. So for access, for an example, we're teaching in a way that acknowledges and value and consider differences of knowing. And again, not solely based on dominant white middle-class values and ideas only. They're a very important part of the process, but it's more about what is the collective that we're gonna norm from. And then for representation, students' cultures are reflected in their expectations and the lesson plans and delivery, the delivery of the learning. The delivery of the learning reflects universal design. Language and lessons are asset-based. So how are we speaking when we talk through um, the work? Instructional materials reflect students across identity markers. Staff reflect the student populations. 
and are part of teaching the lessons. And even in some cases where it's difficult to have staff reflect um, the student populations, which is something schools have to be a lot more intentional of and schools of education have to really rethink, but what ways can we leverage community members that reflect the students to be a part of teaching those lessons? And then for meaningful participation, the school climate allows for safe space for students, parents, community members to provide constructive feedback about what is working and what is not. And here's the thing, when we ask our stakeholders what matters, we have to respond to it. Often, if we don't agree with it, we might put it off to the side and say that it's inappropriate, that it doesn't fit. We have to begin to interrogate, why are we saying that? Um, how are we um, being exclusive unintentionally when we do that? And how does that then set students up to potentially not experience the success that I know all teachers want students to experience? And then for high outcomes, ensuring that when we're teaching those expectations, that the lesson plans reflect the communities in which the school is situated and that all students are set up for success across student identities. And the same thing for monitoring expected behaviors. How are we centering equity across these four constructs, right? We wanna make sure that the adults for access and students have high um, and positive expectations for students across all identity markers. And so if we say we have high expectations for students across all identity markers, but when we look at our data in terms of who's accessing gifted and talented, who's accessing advanced placement, who's getting all of the scholarships, uh, and we see that that's reflective of one group or, or, or uh, one or two groups, that there is a huge gap between what we say we believe and what's actually happening. And so we have to really begin to push ourselves to say, if we believe it, it should begin to manifest itself through our intentional practices and what we see, not only in outcomes, but in the conditions in which students are learning and teachers are teaching. And so again, across each of these expectations, you can see that there are some key pieces that are there, staff, parents, community members, actively engaging and monitoring and ensuring that those behaviors reflect agreed upon culturally nuanced expectations. And students are reporting as you look at survey data and focus group data um, that they're saying they feel uh, like they are safe and they don't feel targeted for discipline. We saw a lot of that in our pilot work where uh, some of the, the leaders were saying, students were saying that they feel targeted. They, they're a group of people and they're the one that's singled out. And so how does that uh, cause students to feel disenfranchised and actually exacerbate the unwanted behaviors? And then for meaningful participation, schools are valuing and using that feedback. And again, making sure that we're paying attention to multiple and diverse perspectives and that that's uh, showing up in the outcomes that we're seeing for students and that we're using asset-based language, language. And when I say asset-based language, I'm talking about people-first language. We have to move away from using words like tier three student, uh, ELL student, um, poor student, um, uh, tier, uh, tier three. So I'm trying to think of all the names that we tend to use for, um, I think a lot of times we use it because it's quicker to say it, but we have to really reframe how we're uh, uh, describing children um, and groups of children. And the same thing for the next big idea of PBIS, encourage and acknowledge appropriate behavior. These are some ways across access, representation, meaningful participation, and high outcomes that we can actually center equity and making sure that we are encouraging with access that we acknowledge appropriate behaviors that include students' lived experiences. And when we're, re when we're correcting and, and, and redirecting that we're using a different type of language. When I was a teacher, I was guilty of well, you may say that at home, but you can't say it here or say this, you need to speak proper English. And by doing that, what I was doing was uh, isolating students and, and, cre and, and creating an, uh, a space of not being inclusive because I was saying that something was wrong with how they were behaving or acting that was perfectly functional in other spaces. So moving to this is the school appropriate behavior that we collectively agreed on, that behavior is uh, uh, completely fine in those scenarios this particular space, here are the ones that we've agreed on. And I'm gonna keep moving because of time, but I just wanna stop and say for each one of these big ideas of PBIS, there are some ways that you can make sure that you're, um, you're considering and centering access, representation, meaningful participation, and high outcomes. And when I look at meaningful participation with this particular continuum um, of you know, supports in terms of addressing behaviors, we want to not just ask parents to come when we're doing a behavior plan or when we send out the annual input data. We really have to begin to think about how are we making sure that their voices are included 
uh, as we're developing, as we're implementing, as we're monitor monitoring? And how are we centering voices that have been historically excluded from the table or not at the table? And how are we asking who's benefiting from the way that we've set these uh, big ideas up and the way that we're implementing them and who is not? And then making some adjustments and some changes based on that. And then for using data for decision making, I'm actually going to spend a little bit of time unpacking this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here now. But again, you can look and see when you look at access, representation, meaningful participation, and high outcomes that there are some very specific things that you can do to make sure that equity is being centered in this particular big idea of PBIS when it's being um, implemented. So let's take a moment and use the chat feature. And I'm going to pause for maybe about 30 to 40 seconds. And Beth will then chime in. And I'll, I'm going to keep moving. But I want you to pause and use the chat feature and share what themes emerge across um, from the crosswalk slides that we just went through. So as you were looking at the big ideas of PBIS and the, and the four constructs of educational equity, did certain things continue to pop up? what emerged and if there's something that's absent what's absent because again we're sharing the work we're doing but we want to improve this at the same time people are already starting to share like really input from stakeholders families of stakeholders you know student voice and participation um engaging parents and community and that's so true it's what's been missing and what continues to be missing in most of our the schools that we've been working with prevalence throughout the family and community voice, um, who is benefiting and who is at the table, like asking those critical questions, um, looking beyond middle-class white values, collective voice. So a lot, just really people seeing that access is key and I um, mean that really being engaged in us making sure that we are not as a school, um, saying we're being culturally responsive, but yet not actually having families and students at the table. And, and yes, absolutely. Well, I'm, I apologize. So I apologize, Beth. Mm -hmm. Beth and I have this thing where she will pause and I'm always looking for air. If you come up for air, I'm going to jump in and start talking. So I do this with her a lot. She has a ways of abusing me too, but we, we work it out. So um, thank you, Beth. My apologies for interrupting while you were sharing. Um, I'm also trying to be thoughtful um, about time. So as Beth was sharing, those are all really important points and things that we have to intentionally make sure that we're doing. Equity is not something that happens by accident. Um, it's something that has to be intentionally done. Uh, and it's hard work, but it is worthwhile work. And when we center equity, it's for, it, 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 it uh, creates positive climate for all students um, in many ways. The research I did in 2014 around looking at um, creating culturally responsive practices within PBIS showed that when we didn't address these things, uh, it kind of, other students modeled the behavior of adults and systems. And so it became very negative. The cultures of schools became very negative. And so when we do this work and we're intentional about it, students will follow and model. I saw in a previous session a question around how do we teach about equity to our students. And there's some resources that I can share from Midwest and Plains. And I'm sure that there are some resources we can share from the PBIS TA Center that can support some of that work in conversations as well. So you've seen this article a few times. This is one of our anchor articles because if we're gonna do equity work, we've got to root it and you know, uh, anchor it to something. And so after spending some time defining educational equity, providing teams with the space to have it, to do their own defining of educational equity and leveraging the articles that, that we had, we then started thinking about what does it look like, feel like, and sound like. And so you've just seen several slides that kind of unpack what it could look like in the big ideas of PBIS. Here's an example of one of the pilot schools on the east side of the state um, of Michigan, where they started after going through and reading the articles and reframing the achievement gap and building some critical consciousness to say, okay, what does uh, acts, what does uh, the big uh, PBIS look like uh, when you center equity at our school? And this is a high school that's engaging in this work. And so what was really exciting was as they did this work, we were able to support honoring uh, this was one of the first professional development sessions done for staff and about the fourth professional development for the school leadership team. They always needed to be a few steps ahead so they can participate in leading the professional learning so that we could build capacity for them to lead this work in our absence. And so as we were co-leading this work, um, 
some of the things that we felt like were really powerful and necessary was we could honor their work. We could say, we could say, look at all the amazing ways you were already centering equity in your work. And then by doing, and we didn't even say it, they said it. We asked them, let's celebrate. Where's equity present based on what you're putting here? And they were able to identify areas where equity was already present. And then on their own, without us having to say anything, before they even looked at their own data, the high school staff was saying, you know what? Uh, we need to elevate student voice. We need to include them more in our decisions and in our conversations. And so we started to see uh, the, 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 the staff themselves use more of a critical lens to say, how could they center equity? And student voice was one of the ways and, and parent um, uh, uh, partnership, those surface. Did I miss anything in terms of something else that surfaced that would be critical to highlight um, that you recall that? Because a lot of things surfaced. It, it did. I'll keep going. Yes, we, we still did see, you know, where a lot of work was, but the strengths and, and it was really nice with the leadership team at this high school. They really, they sat at each table, you know, they spread themselves out and they really helped their teams kind of think and imagine what was missing. And so we really saw some good, um, that really good realizations on their own, like, like Ruthie was saying. So it's so powerful when um, you have really good leadership going into with high school principal into that team and then leading that work because then they're really owning it and um, the more they're coming up with in, in buying in it's, it's really yeah, I appreciate that Beth is surfacing something that's critical uh, we intentionally ask the leadership teams to spread themselves out across the tables and the conversations weren't all flowery and rosy at the tables we're sharing some of the the, the highlights but there were also conversations at the table where people were really wrestling and equity work is about wrestling and we would even say at the end of in the middle of at the beginning of if you're comfortable throughout this entire session then we didn't really talk about equity because the equity is all about disrupting um inequities in the status quo if it's not working for all students it needs to be disrupted and so there were people at tables that were you know um, sharing concerns frustrations but because the leadership team had a lot of buy-in and the principal stood in front of the entire group and owned that this was their work, not our work, and that it was important work. Um, even though people were sharing, you know, their real feelings about where things were, they were engaging in discourse that's tied to equity work, which is a critical part of the work. It's not about silencing people who don't agree or people who may be in a different place of their own awareness. It's about allowing that space for everyone to engage from their entry point and then build on that um, in, in, in po positive um, but challenging ways. We continue to expand learning around the definition of equity by uh, comparing it with equality. So we had lecturettes where we unpacked equity and equality. And so we wanted to kind of make sure people weren't conflating the two concepts because they get highly conflated. And so this is one of the images that we borrowed from the Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center to say that it always feels like everybody's starting at the same place, but the race really isn't equal. It never has been. We have to do work to level the playing field to make sure that, that it is. Because people will say, you know, if you work hard, you'll get there. But what about when you're carrying baggage? What about when you're carrying the baggage of history, the baggage of years of structural inequities uh, that have made it difficult uh, for everyone to start at the same starting point? And, and how do you then run that same race without getting weary, without um, you know, falling out of the race? And we see this time and time again where students fall out of the educational experience because there's so much baggage that has not been addressed in our school systems to support them, um, even though everyone is working hard to try to do that. And so we continue to expand on equity and equality with this activity by saying, giving them multiple pictures. I think we have like six or seven iterations of this image. We used to only have one, but we felt like that was very constricting. And it was also us telling them how to look at equity. Part of doing equity work is not telling people how to be, how to feel and what to do. It's about allowing them to go through a process where they're um, becoming liberated in their own thinking as they think about liberation for students. And so we would have them talk about how, what they see and what they think. And that created learning that wasn't, uh, that decentered Beth and myself as the equity experts and, and began to cause them to be, to see how they could engage in equity work. And then we thought we've got to continue to cultivate critical consciousness. So this is an article that we use to support help, helping people understand 
that we have to um, understand how power, privilege, um, uh, and implicit bias uh, is, in, is complicit in inequities. And so we really did a lot of activities around unpacking power and privilege. So the discussion activity is one that we borrowed. We didn't create it, but we borrowed it. And but we use the context of the school to develop the, the questions that the teams would then ask. We would have them for the discussion read a, a set of statements. You can see the statements here. These are very common statements that people use um, when they're thinking about why achievement gaps um, or opportunity gaps, I, I like to call it, exist. And so as we have them look at the statement, each group would choose one statement and they have to address that statement in question form only. And it really pushes them out of the comfort zone of having an answer and moving more to a question. And what it does is it helps them also to have a strategy that when someone's using deficit language, when someone's uh, trying to fix the kid or blaming family or blaming poverty, that you can begin to ask questions that get them beyond those blaming um, uh, types of strategies or practices that people have used, you know, so education is not valued in all homes. Well, who said that they're not all valued in homes? Why did that, uh, why are people saying that? What, what, what really, uh, how do we really know uh, what's valued in a home if we haven't been there? Are the types of questions that you can ask that give strategies to disrupt um, ways of thinking that are harmful to children and students? And so those are activities that we used before we even looked at the data. And so then we started um, getting into the guide and looking at, I mean, we were already starting to, to collect and, and, and monitor the data, but we really started getting into the data after we unpacked that work. Um, and so we leveraged uh, one, two, and five to do that work. So I just want to take some time now to talk about when we look at data. And these guides, I'm going fast because I'm aware of time, but these are all tools and resources that can be accessed uh, on the National TA Center's website that does a really good job of giving structure for teams to be able to go in and, and begin to address disproportionality um, and center equity um, in schools. As a matter of fact, that's the data guide. And so some critical questions that we infused, uh, started infusing in the four-step problem solving process uh, that I know is starting to be renamed. Is there an inequity in our, in our school? We wanted to move away from problem statement because that tends to focus on fixing students, fixing teachers. We wanted to understand what is the inequity that we're seeing. If there's disparity, there's an inequity. And so what is it about our people, our policies, and our practices that are contributing to these inequities? And then which inequity practices can address the inequities? And then did the strategies that we put in place decrease the disparities? And also, what are students saying about the conditions in which they learn based on the strategies that we put in place? What are parents saying about it? What are teachers saying about it? Hey, as a principal, one of my biggest priorities was I wanted my teachers to want to come to work. So not only did I want them to create a space where kids wanted to come to work, I wanted to, to work to create a space and cultivate a space where teachers wanted to come because they have incredible and, and support staff incredibly difficult work to do that people will never understand if they're not in education, although they think they do. And so each question, we break it down and we talk about it. For step one, who's experiencing the, 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 well, we, the questions you can ask? When, what is the inequity um, that's leading to the disproportionate outcome? Just changing that language alone changes the conversation. And of course, the two questions there that we've been talking about. Teams can then disaggregate data to identify who's experiencing the disparity. We use Swiss drill down to get at these things. Where is the disparity occurring? So we can, we can focus very keen, you know, specifically where things are happening and why is the inequity incur, uh, occurring and when. So this is really using the, big, the drill down features in Swiss to ask questions um, about the disparity. And the exciting news is now is Swiss has the, uh, the report that allows you to actually get at this data pretty quickly. We, um, uh, during the pilot over the last several years, had to use uh, Excel sheets to get at um, uh, monthly referral rates per subgroup to be able to answer some of these questions. And so the next question you ask is step two, why is the disproportionate outcome occurring? What is it about our people, policies, and practices that are contributing to it? And who's at the table as we look at the data analysis piece? Again, who's at the table changes the conversation. During this part of the process, teams can use multiple and should use multiple data sources to evaluate systems, practices, and outcomes. Again, we want to understand what are the conditions in which kids, kids are behaving, kids are learning, teachers are teaching. We want to keep the focus on systems and not on fixing students or teachers. And remember that disparities are linked to systemic inequity. So we have to identify it and address it. Then we want to name the inequity, whether it's about race, ethnicity, gender, religion. Um, and we want to identify specific goals and objectives to address the disparity. For step three, critical questions to ask during plan development, 
what evidence-based equitable practices and strategies can address equities. We're showing several things that we did to, to support that work, but the teams also uh, did some, uh, took some of the learning back to staff and, and make sure they had on every agenda every month, even if it was just for 15 minutes, they were gonna focus on something related to um, centering equity in their work. What activities and tasks need to be implemented in order to get at the, the goals and who's um, at the table when we talk about those activities and tasks. Here's where having student focus groups come in handy to understand more about how they're experiencing school and what they say work. Pedro Maguera says that we ask, we, we, we do a lot of work to try to support students without asking them what's best for them. Students know a lot about what helps them to be successful. So we have to make sure that we ask them. We identify goals at this point to address the disparity and we use resources such as the Culture Responsive Field Guide, uh, resources from the Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center. And we really did a lot of work around understanding how power, privilege, and implicit bias are at work um, uh, to um, uh, be a part of uh, the inequities that we see, whether it's in the thinking, the language, systems of practice. And so we began to try to address those in that way. And then another critical question uh, uh, for step four, you wanna ask, are the practices working? So if you're already implementing PBIS, you can see you're already using this four step uh, you're using something similar for your continuous improvement process or your problem solving process. And so now you're looking at is, you know, um, is the plan working? And so we would come back and look at uh, data, we look at fidelity data with the TFI, which is the tier fidelity inventory to see how well are we implementing PBIS and where do we need to support work across the tiers. And so we also use the culture responsive guide for tier one to, to focus on our building identity uh, and, and, and focusing on other areas. Again, our amazing colleagues are gonna probably cover a lot of that in the next session um, coming up. And then we also look at the disaggregated stakeholder data to understand uh, based on what we're seeing in the discipline data, um, what are we seeing in the stakeholder data and is, are we seeing parallels between that? We also encourage our partners to begin to look at and collect uh, instructional practices data. Again, understanding the conditions in which students are learning and then also impact data, that outcome data. At the center of the four step problem solving process or the continuous improvement process is you've gotta have multiple and diverse perspectives at the table uh, in this process. You have to think about creative ways to do that. Students don't have to be in the whole data review or you can have focus groups. You can have uh, parents, community members get involved. You just think about how are we gonna make sure we're leveraging those voices so we can create systems that are culturally responsive and sustaining because to have systems that are culturally responsive and sustaining is centering equity within PBIS. And so the second um, uh, item that we implement from the National Center's five-point approach to centering equity is making sure that their PBI center systems are culturally responsive and sustaining. And so we leverage the TFI that you can see to the left, or I hope it's to your left, and then the, the responsiveness guide, which is on, on the right. And we, the, the schools were already going in and collecting uh, TFI data. So then we would elaborate. And so you can see an example of one of their, uh, where they collected data twice here in April and then in September. And these are all items at tier one. You can't see one and two because they're cut off. But what we wanted you to know is that the teams looked at these, looked at their actual outcomes. You can see that from column, the first, the, if you look at column 42619, to 9-17-19, you can see that they were increasing their fidelity of implementation, which is a good thing. So then they had to think about how they were going to use the TFI companion. Now, just because you have a one doesn't mean that that's where you want to focus. You want to focus if you have a one on strengthening PBIS. You want to use contextual knowledge across multiple data sets uh, to help you choose which TFI companion guide, uh, uh, T, uh, how you want to elaborate culturally using the TFI companion. And again, my amazing colleagues will talk about this later. One school actually chose three areas to focus on based on their context, their TFI data, their outcome data, and some of their other data sets. And so what they did after that was for 1.6, item 1.6 uh, for discipline policies and, and supportive environments, they leveraged the cultural responsive guide to understand the big idea for PBIS, which is that proactive and instructive response to problem behaviors are more likely to lead to improved student outcomes and exclusionary practices. And then they thought about how do we want to then collab, uh, elaborate on this? And so once they did that, um, they started putting some uh, actions in place to support it. But one thing that was really important was helping them to understand 
examples of cultural elaboration and non-examples of cultural elaboration. And so you can see here that there are several examples that the cultural um, responsive guide field guide provides, but they also provide non-examples. And you can see here what some of those non-examples are. And because I'm feeling that my colleagues are gonna walk through this in more detail and because of time, I'm going to um, move through these and just show you what they look like. This was an example of the item that the team said, we wanna try to use this example because it fits our context. And so because it fit their context, they were able to then go in and do some action items around it. For 1.6, um, they chose to use, uh, uh, these are some examples that you can use for because the, they chose to focus on discipline policies and supportive environments. So for 1.6, uh, two examples of ways that you can get at that with cultural elaboration is using the policy equity analysis tool to look at what policies might be impacting behavior decisions within the school, within the district. And then there's also the key elements of policy guide that can help support looking at some of the policies that impact the decisions that are being made um, around discipline. They also chose to look at 1.7, which was professional development and identity. And we really spent a lot of time around the uh, uh, professional development and identity. And one of the things that I appreciate is that they understood you couldn't just do one professional de development session and hope that people would get it. They, had, they were committed to ongoing professional development over the three years of the pilot. Not just what we provided, but as we progress through the years with new partners, we really encourage that they would continue that professional development, even um, on the off months when we weren't meeting with their staff. Again, the cultural responsive uh, companion guide does a really good job providing examples and non-examples um, for what cultural elaboration should look like. And you can see under examples, the district has a long-term PD plan. And I believe our colleagues in the previous session highlighted that, that you can't just do a hit and miss or one sit and get, you have to really be committed to ongoing learning. So then for, uh, here is a, a, an example 12 for cultural elabor uh, elaboration around professional development for identity. Um, the team spent a lot of time um, engaging in courageous conversation work so that they can talk about identity. They engaged in the staff elements of culture activity, which can be found on 45 and 46 in appendix H um, of the cultural responsive guide. And um, also they, we leveraged several resources from Great Lakes Equity Assistance Center, which is the mid Western Plains Equity Assistance Center to support some of the deeper knowledge around um, identity. We also use um, the article called Teaching Towards Understanding Intersectionality because uh, there are multiple identities that we all possess and they play a role in how we set up classrooms, how we uh, address students, how students experience school. So we really wanted to understand from this activity, the biggest thing was that we have multiple identities that either are privileged or marginalized and often we ask our students to check their identities at the door. So we had them get rid of all of the identities down to one so they could kind of get a feel of the lived experience of what it's like to ask someone to change who they are in order to get an education. And that was a profound activity that was an aha for many people. And then for family um, and, and, and community engagement and voice, you can see the big idea, the cultural elaboration, again, some of the examples and non-examples. And this group, ten, they focused on establishing town hall meetings so they can begin to ask more questions and get feedback from uh, family voice and student voice. And they also leveraged this, uh, starting to disaggregate their current stakeholder sur surveys that they had to understand how different groups of people were experiencing schools so they can problem solve around that as well. So the other thing that we did was make sure that we taught uh, neutralizing routines um, for uh, neutralizing implicit bias. Uh, we spent a lot of time on this each year. We provided more um, training on this so that teams could have their own stop or try strategy that they would use at the classroom level, at the building level. Teams were really happy to have this because they felt like we've got a lot of internal work to do. I don't even know what internal work I need to do yet, but I need something that I can respond to right away to support students. And so people really found, uh, teams found this really helpful and they found that they built a fluency. One um, quote that I can share was, it was almost like um, became like elevator music. You knew it was, they just started doing it without thinking about it because it was embedded in the work. But we also added a safe and inclusive schools framework because we wanted to help teachers understand that there are things that they can do, that administrators can do to make sure school is safe physically, intellectually, culturally, and social emotionally for students. And so this document are prompts that teachers can ask 
that they, things that they do or that the schools do to promote safety in those areas. My son, when he was in third grade, he's out of college now, teacher balled his paper up and threw it in the garbage in front of the class and told him that it was bad writing. She, uh, by doing that, uh, created a space that was unsafe for him intellectually, socially, and emotionally, and even culturally. And that carried with him throughout his entire uh, rest of his learning um, beyond uh, uh, to high school. And so the things we do will either disenfranchise students or be inclusive. And then we provided video links and we've shared the resource for this with the actual clips start and stop times to help teachers identify because they were like, okay, we need to practice this. So we had them look at video footage to identify vulnerable decision points, identify possible neutralizing routines that the teacher used and ways that the teacher fostered safety, safety and, and inclusivity. And so these are the outcomes um, that we, we had for uh, the, the pilot schools where we started making more of the drastic changes that we were talking about. Over the course of the three years, you can see that the red line represents our African-American students. The blue line represents our partners, uh, white students. And this, uh, this language here shows when we actually started the pilot work. So you can see where um, partners were with regards to their disproportionality um, and discipline before the pilot started. You can see that this is annual rates, uh, um, rate of major discipline and referrals by subgroup and the number of referrals per days per um, 100 students enrolled. And you can see that this, this school significantly closed their gap during the course of the pilot um, work. They also lowered their referrals for um, um, across the, the board. So it wasn't just um, lowering um, their African-American students referrals, they decreased their overall referrals. I know there's some slight elevation there, but you can see there's more of a decrease um, uh, that, that you can see there. They went from 5,930 referrals to 1,235 uh, referrals in one school year um, as a result of, am I getting that right? And uh, over the course of the pilot, my apologies. And then quickly, this is just shifts in adult behaviors. It's not just about student outcomes, but it's also about adult behaviors and, and outcomes. And so what we saw was at the beginning of, you can see years one, two, and three, these colors may be hard to see, but the behaviors that we saw were denying and ignoring the race-based gaps, focusing on students and families from deficit constructs, focusing on adult behaviors, um, focusing on school systems, and focusing on relationships. In year one, there was way more of uh, focusing on uh, denying and ignoring the race um, base gap that they saw, focusing on students and families from deficit perspectives too. As you get to year three, focusing more on systems and focusing on relationships um, and folk, I mean, focusing on systems and focusing on adult behavior, which is important in this work. One of our second pilot schools also closed their gap. It took them a little bit longer to do it. And part of that was when you look at um, some of their behaviors, there was still more denying the gap um, more blaming and focusing on students and families and less of focusing on adult behaviors and school systems. And, uh, but that changed over time. So we saw some correlation, although we can't say that one directly impacted the other. We saw correlation across you know, those. And so um, the other thing we want to share as we wrap up is that um, cultivating critical consciousness and adult, adult outcomes is really important. And I think my colleague is going to quickly talk about this. So I'm going to hand it over. So one of the things that um, I saw in, and Ruth will share also, but in the, the school that we're just um, continuing the work with is a very progressive school. They um, saw the need for the work, but they were very resistant to actually seeing how they were complicit in the work. In the school teams, we saw this with, we spent monthly time with the school leadership team and they were looking at how they were, I mean, really being critically conscious of their own um, behaviors, their own way they taught, the, their own way they, you know, interacted and referred students, but it just, the staff was really struggling. They could see it as a need for other white people, honestly, but not um, how they were um, complicit. And we're starting to see some movement in that, but it was, it is something to really be aware of with really highly progressive white um, staff is that that can be a, um, a real barrier is they see the need and they see it outside themselves though. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, the one thing we think is important that across the schools that um, completed the pilot work and where we are seeing some outcomes is that 
the district leadership teams were very much a part of that. Um, they had, they wrote in their board education goals, uh, the equity work. They wanted to align their beliefs with the work. They reallocated resources to support the work, having coaches assigned to the equity work and to PPIS work. Um, they set PBIS and equity as priorities. They monitor progress regularly and they were very, very visible and engaged throughout the pilot process. And so we're closing up here, but what we wanna say is that this equity work is ongoing. Uh, I like the quote from um, Coretta King Scott. She says, struggle is a never ending process. Freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it in every generation. This is our generation. And so we have the beautiful opportunity to to earn it and win it in our generation and, and pass things to our next generation. We know we won't completely fix everything, but we can, we can do what we can do and make our mark. And then I also appreciate something that um, Barack Obama said when he did the eulogy of John Lewis. He says, democracy is not automatic. It has to be nurtured. It has to be tended to. We have to work at it. It's hard. And I feel that way about equity. I scream it from the bottom of my lungs. Equity in education is not automatic. It has to be nurtured. It has to be tended to. We have to work at it. And it's hard, but it is worthwhile. So we thank you for your time today. We thank you. And I think um, we have uh, Dr. McIntosh in the background, but we wanna make sure you go in and do the evaluation so we can continue to learn about ways to improve and be responsive. And I'll just stop there. <laughs> yeah, so if you uh, are able to, we really encourage you to take that survey um, to evaluate it. We use that for uh, the future and improving what we do. You can look at that little blue link on the left side that says take survey and uh, it'll show up for you right there. Um, and, uh, and then also I will see if I can stick it up on the screen as well. And you can take a look, let me just get it up and available for you. Right. Here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kat. And thank you all.